Hello, everyone. Let's start our lecture for today. So in the previous lecture, we talked about loop antenna. And in particular, we talked about a small loop. This one has a circumference less than lambda by 10. And we also talked about full wavelengths loop where C is approximately lambda. So the reason I'm saying approximately is that maybe you need to do some tuning similar to half a wavelength dipole antenna that you cut a little bit from that. So, but we call it full wavelength uh, loop antenna. So the main difference was when you look at the current distribution of a small loop, so the current is uh, what, like what you had in, for example, ECE3580 for a loop, but then you go to full wavelengths loop antenna, then the current distribution is more complicated. So you get something like this, and uh, this becomes your current distribution. So keep this in mind that current distribution is different, and the consequence of that is that this antenna here on the axis has an all, this antenna on the axis will have a maximum. So that's what we had in the previous lecture. Now, in today's lecture, we're not going to discuss these two antennas. We're mainly going to focus on this a small loop antenna here, and uh, we're going to be focusing on this, and we're going to try to find its radiated fields, E and H. So let's uh, start with this, and to, so the, this is gonna, not going to be discussed, and the one that we're going to be discussing would be this one. So let's uh, start with the coordinate. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that the loop is in the xy plane. So this is going to be, for example, my loop. Let's assume the radius, for example, is A. And this is my loop. This is the transmission line that brings the power to this loop. I made it a little bit larger so that you can see it better. But you know that the loop is a small, a small with respect to wavelengths. So this would be the current on the loop that we have. And now we need to uh, find its far field E and H. Now, to a start, you know that our first step is to find magnetic vector potential. So I'm just gonna write A R, which is our magnetic vector potential. I'm just gonna write the equation for that. Mu naught four pi, you remember it's J R prime E to the power of minus j k r minus r prime then r minus r prime dv prime now j r prime is actually our current now i can start by substituting that so what is my current first of all the current is uniform because it's so small if you look at for example short circuited transmission line this is the current distribution so if you take a, a small piece of that you see, this variation is so tiny, so you just take it to be uniform. So it's I naught, for example. So we take it to be I naught. Remember, this is a phasor because we need time varying currents for radiation. So this is my I naught. And what would be my J? First, remember that J is a vector. So I naught would be I naught phi hat. Because Remember, this is actually going in the phi hat direction. I mean, this is not quite phi hat because if you remember, this is your phi hat. This is my phi hat direction. So this is actually negative of a phi hat. It doesn't matter. I can put a negative, but just to be consistent with my notes, I'm just going to change the direction to this direction so that I'll be consistent. So this is I naught phi, I naught phi hat. Re, something regarding phi hat that's important. Look at phi hat. At different locations, phi hat changes the direction. For example, compare this one with this one. They're not identical. It's different than, for example, Z hat. If you have Z hat, all of these guys are Z hat. So you see Z hat doesn't change. But this one changed. Therefore, we need to be careful when we are using a unit vector we charge for angles like phi hat, theta hat. And because we need to be careful, I'm going to be consistent with the coordinate, with the convention that I mentioned. I'm going to use prime coordinate. So, so prime coordinate for source, 
and this phi hat is for my current. So I'm just going to put phi prime hat to know that this is essentially part of my source. Now, if I do that, so now I have I naught phi prime hat. And then what would be my E minus J K R minus R prime? So this is another type of challenge that we have. Because R, for example, you could be in the far field, you have an R. For example, your R could be a distance R from the origin R hat. What is your R prime? R prime for dipole antenna was very simple. Remember, if you had a dipole antenna along the Z axis, if this was the origin, if this was X, this was Z, then R prime connect you from the origin to somewhere in the antenna. So somewhere in the antenna, you are on Z, so you would call it Z prime, Z hat. So simple. But here, R prime is a bit more complicated, so we need to be careful with that. So what would be the definition of R prime? You connect the origin to some point on the antenna. That would be your R prime. So now, what is this, what is this uh, vector? So if you project it here, and project it here, this angle would be phi because I'm talking for the source, I'm gonna use prime. So that's gonna be, uh, R prime would be A. A is the radius of the circle. So this is the, from here to here is A. So it would be A cos phi prime x hat plus A sine phi prime y hat. So I'm gonna have, an x component and a phi component. And because x hat and y hat, they don't change direction with respect to uh, different points, I'm just gonna keep them as x hat and y hat, not like phi, which I wrote phi prime hat to make sure I'm not making mistake. Now, if you look at this r and r prime, you can of course subtract them, but then when you subtract them, you might say, okay, put on here we have r hat, but here we have x hat and y hat, how can we subtract them? Then to do that, you need to convert your R hat into, for example, Cartesian coordinate. Then R hat in Cartesian coordinate would be sine theta cos phi, X hat plus sine theta sine phi, Y hat plus cos theta Z hat. Now, this is your observation point. This is your, uh, this is your uh, source point. Now, here you might also get confused a little bit and say, okay, why did you use phi prime here, but not phi prime here? The reason is, in this case, I'm spanning over the source. For example, this would be my phi prime. One time here, 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 and so on. This phi over here is essentially for my observation point. Let me make you an example. Imagine you are, for example, observing on this, on the, for example, let, let me, let, let, let's say, for example, on the X axis in the far field. So your observation point, because you are on the X axis, will have a phi of zero, because phi is with respect to X. So observation point will have a phi of zero. But when you are calculating this, because you need to integrate all of these tiny sources on the loop, your phi prime can start changing from zero all the way to 360 back. So phi is fixed for a fixed observation point, but you need to integrate over phi prime because phi prime is your sources. So these two are not identical. So now you have this R minus R prime, you can place, you can put it here and then you can you can assume it's far field. This is a small to do some simplification on that. And the other thing that's a bit complicated here is that this phi prime hat is actually part of integration. Remember in dipole antenna, when I wrote I naught Z hat, I told you you can take this Z hat out of integration. And this is, this is, I mean, very natural because all Z hat are in the same direction. When you sum them up, you can just assume all of them are in the Z hat and sum the magnitude, which is I naught, for example. But here it's a different story because this phi prime hat, again, let me plot that for you. One time is here, one time is here, 
one time is here, one time is here. So you cannot take it out of the integration. So you need to actually have this as part of the integration. Then you might say, okay, how can I have this as part of my integration? Because that's a, that could be a challenge by itself. You need to convert that to X hat and Y hat. So this is the way that you have that as part of the integration. So let me let me write that for you here. So so imagine this is your this is phi hat vector. So let me call it phi prime. So essentially this is x axis. You think of it as a force that wants to rotate x axis. So that's phi prime at a certain angle, phi prime. So now what would be the X component? This is the X component if you project it, and this is gonna be the Y component. If this is phi prime, this is also phi prime. So this component over here would be actually cos phi prime Y hat. This component here would be minus sine phi prime X hat. So when you project your phi prime hat, this is what you get. So let me write it for you. Phi prime hat becomes minus sine phi prime x hat plus cos phi prime y hat. So when you have something like that, let's check it for the simplest case. The simplest case is when you are on the x axis. So your phi prime hat would be this. You want to move x axis. So this is at phi prime equals zero. You plot phi prime equals zero, this becomes zero, this becomes one. So as you see, your phi prime hat is the same as y hat. Now let's go, let's rotate like that and get to this point. And now this is your phi prime hat. So now what is the angle here? 90. Now let's plot that here. Minus sine 90 minus one minus x hat plus zero. So your phi prime hat at this point should be minus x hat, which as you see, if this is x, this is actually minus x hat. So my expression there is correct. So therefore, to integrate, you're going to write that as minus sine phi prime x hat plus cos phi prime y hat. You're going to plug that here. So I'm just going to write it uh, without any simplification. But you know what r and r prime I'm talking about. And what would be the element of integration? Because this is a line current, the element of integration would be an element of a length. So for example, this element here. And what is this element when you, when you have a small angle? So this is small angle, it's the element of angle. So let's call it d phi prime. Then this becomes a d phi prime. So, let me have a more clean picture here. So if you have a circle, and this is an element of length, a small, this, because this is a small, this angle is a small, we call it d phi prime. This, the radius is a. If you remember the definition of radian, this becomes a d phi prime. So the element of length becomes a d phi prime. Now you can easily integrate that, not easily, you still need lots of work, but now it's, it, everything is there, from zero to two pi. So phi prime goes from zero to two pi. Remember, because you've converted to x hat and y hat, you can integrate these two separately and you can take x hat and y hat out of integration. I'm not gonna continue with that. The, the, the full derivation is in my course note. You can check it out. Uh, the reason I'm not, I'm not going to the details of this is that I'm going to show you a simpler method. Uh, so, but this is a still very important because the simpler method has its own limitation. But this is very general. Uh, uh, please uh, look at it in my course note to see the derivation. But the important things, I've already mentioned it. And after you find your A, then, this, then it's very a standard, right? After finding A, what's gonna happen? As you see, you're gonna have an AX and AY. Potentially you have both of them because you have the two components. Then you, you should convert to AR 
a theta a phi to a spherical coordinate. We're not going to use a r, so I don't care about this one. Then you're going to say, what is my a theta? That brings me to e theta. What is my a phi? That brings me to this. And you see that one of them would be zero. In fact, this one. And then you can find your h by plane wave relation. And this becomes your h. So this is, this is the situation that we have for, uh, for a starting with this magnetic vector potential. Now, the, so the simpler way of doing that would be simpler in terms of calculation. So instead of doing it based on this procedure, which could get complicated for the reason, one of the reason is that the current is in the phi hat or phi prime hat direction. But in dipole, we had currents on, let's say, z hat. These are simpler because z hat is a constant vector. Now, to do that, we're going to convert our loop antenna to a different current. So we model it as a current that we call it magnetic current. So essentially that would create a simpler model for us. So this is of course an actual current, electric current, but we convert it to a model that we call it magnetic current. And so, and you're gonna see how, it, how we're gonna do that. But this concept of magnetic current that we used in antenna, and this is the first example of that. That's very helpful when it comes to analyzing some forms of antenna that then, then it's going to simplify your, uh, it's going to simplify the way that you can think of those antennas. For example, in this case, you're going to see how I'm going to convert it to a magnetic current. But then for other antennas in this course, I'm going to also mention how can you convert something to, to magnetic currents and take advantage of this concept? But this is just a start. It's going to hopefully be more clear as we continue. So the, the way to do that is that if I have, if I have a loop, so if this is my loop, And this loop has to be a small loop. So th this one that I'm teaching right now doesn't work for your uh, one lambda loop. This is for a small loop. So you, you know that you have a uniform current I naught. Then you would, okay, you would say, okay, what is the direction of magnetic field that is generating? It would be along the Z axis. So you said, okay, I'm going to replace this antenna by an equivalent model. And this equivalent model is going to have what we call magnetic current along the z axis so like that so you see when i use two arrows in this course i mean magnetic current so it's the it's actually it was an electric current but then we had some maybe hard time analyzing it with electric current we could always do that but let's say we wanted to go a simpler approach so we convert it to magnetic current so essentially we say okay this is in this direction therefore this would be the direction of magnetic current if i change the direction of my loop that you need to find the direction of um, uh, again magnetic corresponding magnetic field and then you have the direction of magnetic current so if this is going to be z this is going to be x this is going to be y so loop is in x y so magnetic current would be along z so and then I usually write it with the subscript L, M. So to say this is I, M. Electric current, I usually just write it as I. Or if I want to emphasize when I have them beside each other, I might say I electric, electric current. That's the actual current that we have. This is our model. So we might model different things with magnetic current. So this is the model. This is the actual thing. Now, so you convert it to let's let's say magnetic dipole because now it is it is like a dipole you have in phase current in the z direction or if you want i can plot it like that too and two arrows to say this is like a magnetic current in the z direction or instead of having this excitation gap 
I could just plot it like that. Both of them are the same thing. Sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't, but th that's the same thing. So this and this, I'm using this interchangeably. So this is my magnetic current. And then you also remember for dipole antenna, what was important was the, the current on the dipole and the lengths of the dipole. But what is the, when I convert this to this model, what is the lengths? We have an equation for that. The equation says I M L is equal J, J is for imaginary number, S area of the loop, omega mu naught I or I naught, the actual current of the loop. So you see, if I know the area of my loop, which is pi A squared, if I know two pi F, permeability of free space, I naught, the actual current, I can have I M times L. At this point, you might object that you just know multiplication of these two. But if you remember your dipole, or to be uh, precise here, if you remember your electric dipole, you remember that the thing that mattered was actually when I had the electric dipole like this, infinitesimal dipole, if this was current I naught, at the end, what was important was this area under this curve, which was I naught times the length of the dipole I naught L. So current times length was what important. So at the end for this one, I don't need I M separately. I need I M times the length of this model which I already have based on my actual current and the area of the loop antenna. So this is what I have. So you agree with me that I now have my I M times its length. So it's a magnetic dipole with uh, the current magnetic current times length equal to this. Okay, now you might say how it helped me. I would say the way that it helped you was that this is now the current is more complicated, but this current is just along the Z axis and it could help us. But this is not the only reason the concept of magnetic current can also be very useful when we are thinking of design. And I try to elaborate on that later on in this course. So now, Remember, because this current was uniform, it was a small loop, this I M is also uniform. So it is not going to be like half a wavelength dipole antenna like that, or a small dipole like this. It's actually like infinitesimal dipole where the current was uniform. So this is our uniform current, magnetic current here. Now, so when, when you are dealing with electric current, what what is the procedure to find the far field this is the procedure you find a as mu naught divided by 4 pi j r prime e to the power of minus j k r minus r prime r minus r prime dv prime so this is the first step you find what we call magnetic vector potential magnetic vector potential. That's the first step that you have with electric current. So this is here was electric current. And if I wanna be careful, I should say electric current density in this equation. Now, when you have magnetic current, you have almost exactly the same thing, but with magnetic current. So you have an auxiliary function called F of R, and instead of mu, now you have epsilon naught permittivity, 4 pi. And then you're going to have magnetic current density. And then this was the Green's function of free space or transfer function. So free space is just free space is there. So you're going to get the same thing. So now this was called magnetic vector potential when we are dealing with electric current. Now this is called electric vector potential, this auxiliary function that we have here. It's called electric vector potential, and this is your magnetic current density. This is your model. This is your actual current. So then what was the next step here? You would say, okay, after finding that, find E theta as minus J omega A theta 
E phi as minus J omega A phi and ER, we know that it's zero. So that was the next step here. What would be the next step here? Almost identical. We would say H theta is minus J omega F theta. H phi is minus J omega F phi and HR is zero. So that was, that's, this would be the structure here. And what is the next step here? Actually, final step, you just find H from E based on plane wave equation. So here, again, you are in the far field, so you could do the same thing. Now, this time, find E from H. And if you try to find E from H from this equation, you get to this equation here. And as you see, this time h was eta times a smaller. Now e is eta times larger than h. So this is the structure that we have in in, a, in antenna. Now, so let me review that. This was for electric current. You need to perform this integral when you are dealing with, in, with electric current. And the currents that we have are always electric. So you can always use that. But the problem is sometimes it gets complicated. When it gets complicated, then we have another model too that you can take advantage of. You can convert to magnetic current. You're gonna learn under what condition you can. And then follow this procedure. Then you need to find a new auxiliary function, which is which gonna integrate M. And if you do that, then the next step is to find H from F. And after that, you're gonna find E from H. Now, somehow we have our whole course in this whiteboard right now. What is the, the first step when you are designing the antenna? You need to make sure that the input impedance is good so that the power is gonna make it to the antenna. So you need to have a good input impedance. So, so let me write that here. So input impedance needs to be good. And then when you look at this structure here, if you modeling your antenna, if, if you're using electric current, you need to make sure that you're using electric currents in a way that you get a good A, because this is a summation of electric currents. So you're summing up some electric currents. So if they cancel the effect of each other, you essentially get no A, and then you get nothing. So you need to make sure that you have some J that's helping each other toward a good A and then here. Now, if we go to this structure, if I model everything in terms of magnetic current, you see that everything is a summation, integration of magnetic current multiplied by some weight. So you need to make sure that this summation would give you some, some good F so that you get the desired radiation that you want. So this is essentially our course, uh, the, the main, the, the, the fundamental aspect of our course, that we need to make sure this is checked, and then we need to somehow create J or M that's gonna be helping us toward getting desired A, desired F, so that it ends up to the radiation that we want. So that's our, that's our structure that we need to find our uh, F in this case. So now we need to go and apply this to to find the far field of this loop antenna. So instead of using this for the loop antenna, I'm going to be using this to calculate the far field of loop. So I convert my loop to this, and then I'm going to use that. So that would be my procedure. Convert this to this using the equation that says I M L is J S omega mu naught I and then use this to get to my far field E and H for the small loop antenna. So that would be what we're gonna do in the remaining part of this lecture. Okay, so let's uh, continue with this and check how we can calculate this F. So let me clean up the whiteboard a little bit and start writing these equations. Okay, so let's say this is my z-axis, this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, and then I'm gonna have my 
IML here. So this is current IM, and I know the length. So I know the multiplication of that. So let's start with my F. F is going to be epsilon naught 4 pi, and it's going to be the magnetic current IM. And remember, this magnetic current is now in the z hat direction. So I'm going to have it in the z hat direction. And then I'm going to have e to the power of minus j k r minus r prime, r minus r prime. And then the element of integration, which because it's on, on the z, it's going to be simply d z prime. So this is going to be the integral that I have, and it's going to be from minus L divided by 2 to plus L divided by 2, because the total length is L. So minus L divided by 2 to plus L divided by 2. Now, as you know, because Z hat is a constant vector, of course, you can take it out of the integration. And remember, this is structure in terms of R and R prime is so simple. This is your R observation point, and R prime is any point from origin to, to, to the antenna. So this is going to be R minus R prime because we started with the circumference very small. This is also a very small antenna. So similar to infinitesimal dipole antenna or a small dipole antenna, I can just simply approximate that by the following. So it's going to be epsilon naught 4 pi, z hat, i m is also uniform. You can take it out. And then this is going to be minus j k r r according to according to our approximation, and then d z prime. So if that's the case, you could have you could see that this is also independent of d z prime. That's again we approximated this with this. So that's going to become epsilon naught four pi. I m e to the power of minus j k r r, and then we're gonna have z hat z hat d z prime minus l divided by two to plus l divided by two. This is gonna be l, so that's gonna become epsilon naught four pi i m length e to the power of minus j k r r. Z hat. So this is what we have. And as you see, now we have I m times L, the total length that we already had. So this is what we needed and we, we have it here. So I m L and this is the I m L. So this is my electric vector potential F at observation point R. And I have it here. So remember, this is now completely known because I know that I M L according to model is J, area of the loop, omega mu naught I. And I naught is the current, the actual current of the loop. So this is my F. I have it. Now I need to proceed to the next step. But before proceeding to the next step, remember next step requires F to be in a spherical coordinate. So I need to convert that to a spherical coordinate. So let's let's do that. So if you remember, this is the conversion fr, f theta, f phi. And that's going to be sine theta cos phi, sine theta sine phi, cos theta cos theta cos phi, cos theta sine phi, minus sine theta, minus sine phi, cos phi zero, and fx, fy, fz. So this is the conversion. So on this side, I have the Cartesian one. On this side, I have the spherical one over there. So now you know that F has only Z component, so I don't have Fx, Fy. And you also know that you don't care about Fr. So although this might exist, but this is not in our formulation, so I don't even need to find it. So I'm going to start with F theta. My F theta becomes this times 0, this times 0, minus sine theta Fz. So this becomes my F theta. 
Now, F phi becomes this times zero, this times zero, zero times this. So I end up to have F phi equals zero. So this is the situation that I have. Therefore, F theta is minus sine theta times F z. Now, what is the next step? The next step says H theta is minus J omega F theta. Because F theta is minus sine theta F z, therefore H theta becomes J omega sine theta F z when you substitute that here. And then H phi was minus j omega f phi, which is going to be 0 because f phi is 0. So now I know my h component is only h theta and is equal to that. Therefore, I can just write it here that my h theta is going to be j omega sine theta times f z. And this is my f z, which is epsilon naught 4 pi i m l e to the power of minus j k r r that's going to be my h theta that i have here and it's interesting that you see this sine theta angular dependency this is similar to infinitesimal dipole antenna and a small dipole antenna but just to remind you remember for the dipole that we studied before and i can say electric dipole to contrasted with this magnetic dipole, then you had H phi. If this is my electric dipole, then H gonna go around it. But then if this is now magnetic dipole, the one that we have here, then this is gonna be your H. H is H theta. Again, this is for electric dipole that we studied earlier. This is your H, H phi. And now this is H theta would be for the magnetic dipole in this case. Now, this is your H theta, and then you can, of course, go and find your E based on this equation, that E is minus eta r hat cross H. And your H is H theta theta hat. So it's a theta uh, component. So you, we know that r hat cross theta hat is phi hat. So we're going to get minus eta phi hat h theta. So this is going to be r e. So I can just substitute that here and see what we're going to get in this case. So let's, let's do that. So uh, my e becomes e phi becomes minus eta times h theta, which is going to make it minus j omega eta sine theta epsilon naught 4 pi i m l e to the power of minus j k r r that's going to be my e phi in this case and again i'm going to have my sine dependency in this case so so this is something that uh, you can you can easily observe and then we can do some simplification on this to make it to make it a little bit easier, and we can we can see that uh, and as as I simplify this equation more. Okay, so now that we have derived our e phi and h theta, perhaps we can simplify them a little bit to get to our final expression. So let's do that. To start simplifying, the only thing that we essentially need to do is to substitute for I, M, L. And we can start by doing that for, for example, uh, H theta. That's J omega sine theta, epsilon naught, 4 pi. If you remember, I, M, L was J, S, omega. Maybe I substitute for S directly. S was the area, pi A squared, omega mu naught I naught. That's my I M L together. And E to the power of minus J K R R. So that's going to be J and J would be negative one. So I'm going to have negative. 
And then I have, so J and J gone, omega and omega are going to make it minus omega squared, mu naught and epsilon naught, mu naught, epsilon naught. Then I'm going to have pi and pi cancel. So I can keep that, I mean, because I, it might be a good idea to keep the pi A squared because that's area. So let's, let's just keep that. So I'm just going to keep the 4 pi here and pi a squared here too. So that's that's gone. And I'm going to have my i naught squared and I'm going to have my sine theta. And this is our famous e to the power of minus j k r r. That's always there. This sine theta give us pattern. Remember that this quantity is k. Remember k is omega c or 2 pi divided by lambda. This is going to be omega 1 divided by a square root of mu naught epsilon naught, which is omega mu naught epsilon naught. So a square of that would be this. So I can just write it as minus k2 4 pi pi a square i naught sine theta e to the power of minus j k r r. So if you want to simplify at this point a little bit more, I mean, if you want, you can remove pi. I just kept it because that indicates area. But if you remove it, you end up with minus Ka to the power of 2 divided by 4 i naught sine theta e to the power of minus jkrr. So that becomes your h theta. So this is your h theta, and this is beautiful in the sense that, remember, dimensions that we have in electromagnetics are with respect to wavelength. So when you say ka, k is 2 pi lambda a, which you can think of it as 2 pi a divided by lambda. So this radius is relative to the wavelengths, and that's this expression would be right here. So this is my h theta. Now, I can go to E5, and if you look at your E5, the only thing that, that happens here is that you're going to have a negative sign here that you didn't have here, and it's going to be eta times larger. So I, I can just multiply by minus eta, and I get my E5. So my E5 becomes minus eta times that, and that's going to bring me eta k a square 4 i naught sine theta e to the power of minus j k r r that becomes my e phi and if you want to see where the power is going you can of course do e cross h so remember power density power density is half e cross h complex conjugate. Now, if if you have this, you can see that it's going to be half e phi phi hat, because this is phi, cross with h theta, complex conjugate, of course, then theta hat. This is theta. Now, what is phi hat cross theta? This is r hat, theta hat, phi hat, like that. So if you do phi hat cross theta and you go reverse, you get minus r hat. So this gives you minus r hat. So you might think that now you're going in the minus r hat direction. Remember, if this is r, this is minus r hat. These are all minus r hat. But obviously, this is not correct because it's radiating outward. So it should be plus r hat. So the thing that you're missing and you this is the reason that uh, it's going to become plus r hat is because of this negative sign that we have here. So phi hat cross theta hat is going to give you minus r hat, but because you have a negative sign here, that becomes plus r hat. So the power is outgoing in the plus r hat direction. So that's, a, that's essentially a side note here. Now, we could calculate this, and if we calculate it, this is going to become... Okay, so, so far we arrived at, at this e phi and this h theta that I wrote here, and we mentioned that we would like to calculate power density. So let's start that. W becomes half e 
cross H complex conjugate. So if you start multiplying that, this becomes half. You have a half here. You have four. You have four here. So four and four, 16 times 232. You get your 32 here. And then you have eta. And then you're going to get Ka to the power of four. And then you're going to have your I naught square, you're going to get your sine a square, and you're going to have your R2 here. Remember, e to the power of minus jkr from e times h complex conjugate, that becomes e to the power of plus jkr when you're complex conjugated, so it becomes e to the power of j0, which is 1, so that's why it's not there. So this is our W. So I have my W and uh, base and remember the direction. So I have phi hat cross theta hat. Phi hat cross theta becomes minus R hat. With this negative sign, it becomes plus R hat. So the power is radially outward. Now radiation intensity is R2W. So essentially you're removing the R2 dependence. Uh, and if you if you do that, and remember, with radiation intensity, we don't need the vector because we know that it's radially outward. It becomes 1 divided by 32, eta, ka to the power of 4, i naught squared, sine 2 theta. <clears throat> now, if you have your note, compare this with the radiation intensity of infinitesimal dipole or a small dipole, and you see that all of them have sine a square theta. And in particular, for these a small loop, theta equals zero and theta equals 180 results in no radiation nulls. And that's the axis of the loop. So along the axis, if it's a small loop, you're not gonna have any radiation. On the plane of the loop, which is x, y plane, theta is equal 90, and you get maximum radiation. So this is my u. Now, remember, if you want to calculate, for example, directivity, what, would, what do we need? Directivity is U of the antenna divided by this U of isotropic, assuming the same radiated power. If the radiated power is P rad, then divided by four pi, that gives you the radiation intensity of isotropic, which is gonna be four pi U theta and phi P rad. Now to calculate P rad, what you need to do, you need to integrate u over element of solid angle. And that's going to be integration from 0 to 2 pi for phi, 0 to pi for theta. Your u is here, so you're going to place 132, eta, ka, 4, i naught, a square, sine 2 theta. The element of solid angle would be sine theta d theta d phi. And as you can imagine, integration over phi is the easiest. It's just 2 pi because there is no phi dependency. You just get the 2 pi. And then 132 comes out of integration. Eta comes out of integration. The same thing with ka4. And then i naught squared. Oh, by the way, one note regarding i naught squared. If you look at here, I naught, I naught. I didn't, I didn't write I naught a square. I, I wrote magnitude of I naught a square. The reason for that is that I naught is a phasor. So when you, so potentially it can be a complex number. So it's a phasor. So you have E cross H complex conjugate. So this becomes I naught times I naught complex conjugate. And a number times this complex conjugate it's, mag it's going to be equal to its magnitude squared. So, uh, so this is, uh, keep that in mind. That's the reason I wrote it like that. So, and that's magnitude of I naught squared here. And then I get sine cube theta. If you integrate sine of cube theta from 0 to pi, that's going to be 4 divided by 3. So that's our... 4 divided by 3 here. So this is going to be my P rad. So now if I want directivity, I can start substituting. So I'm going to have 4 pi for that. My U is just here. 
it's 1 divided by 32, eta ka 4 i naught squared sine 2 theta divided by p rad. And p rad I just calculated here. 2 pi, 1 divided by 32, eta ka 4 i naught squared, and then 4 divided by 3. And you can start canceling. So eta, eta, this, 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 2 pi, 4 pi, 2, this and this cancel, and this becomes 6 divided by 4, which is going to be 3 divided by 2. So I can perhaps uh, remove this line here and say that my directivity becomes equal to 6 divided by 4. It's 1.5 sine 2 theta. So this is the directivity of a small loop antenna, which is identical to a small dielectric dipole, a small electric dipole, or uh, infinitesimal dipole. So, okay, the other thing I wanted to show you was the radiation resistance of the small loop antenna. So, to to this end, I wrote the p radiated that we found, which is this one here. So, this is the p radiated that we had. And then I equate it to half R R I naught squared. That's the power radiated based on the radiation resistance. So by equating these, and I did some calculation here, I arrive at this equation. So uh, the only thing that it might, because it, it, I need to note here is that eta is 377, which is 120 pi. So I substituted by that, then also, k is 2 pi divided by lambda, so I have 2 pi divided by lambda here. And as soon as you do that, you see that 2 pi a is the circumference of the loop c. So you get c circumference divided by lambda 4, and then this cancellation is going to give you 20 pi a square. So you directly see that the radiation resistance of a small loop depends on the circumference to the power of 4, and circumference is meaningless. We should say circumference with respect to wavelengths. This formula only holds if the loop is small, because we assume a certain current distribution and we arrived here. If the loop becomes smaller that that does, current does not hold, then you need to rederive everything. Okay, I think that's all for lecture today, and we're going to continue with the rest of the materials in the next lecture. Thank you very much.